And, you know, one of the things that we would love to ask you about is just given the nature of the times right now and everything that we were talking about, the collective energies and, you know, so much that's happening in our world right now. Um, how are you, you know, finding that material and are you revisiting it in, in a different way? Yeah, I love this question because the law of one has absolutely come to life for me in a brand new way through this whole pandemic era. Um, and probably the most notable way that it's come alive is in understanding how polarity works. Because when I was studying the law of one, I've, I think I've listened to it through eight times now. So let's say the first like four times through five times through, um, I couldn't really connect with the whole idea of the service to self path. Like I acknowledged that it was true and it, it made sense, but like, I don't know what that would even be like to be service to self. Um, so like a lot of what Ra would say about the negative polarity, I'll go, okay, you know, mental note taken, but I didn't have any like experiential nexus for it, but I understood it conceptually enough to where once this whole pandemic era started rolling out and we started to see a lot of these service to self strategies being used um, by the government, by the media, by regulatory bodies, medical industry, just everywhere we're being inundated with all the classic examples Ra gives of how the negative path takes control through very clever deceit and like false light and things like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, I see it now. I understand how the negative polarity works. It makes perfect sense that in the same way that the positive polarity polarizes by honoring free will and protecting free will, uh, the negative path polarizes by capturing free will and manipulating free will. Uh, the, the two polarities have to be perfect opposites to one another, right? So all that to say, um, my perspective and awareness of this whole sort of a great reset, great awakening we're seeing happen on our planet has also shifted dramatically from you know the first year, year and a half-ish. It's a lot of stress, um, anxiety, a little bit of fear comes up, a lot of anger about the injustices. And because of the law of one, understanding how our planet is moving into the next density, right? We, when we move into the next density, the planet has to draw a very harsh line between the positive and the negative polarity because we're the planet is literally choosing which polarity it wants to be. And so it has to make this really like, sort of like in the Bible, separating the wheat from the chaff, or the sheep from the goats, you know, Jesus gave all those parables. Um, it's funny because Jesus even called it the harvest in the passage. Jesus said, you know, the, the harvest is drawing near, um, but the, the workers, the laborers are very few. And that's echoed in Ra's teaching so many times where Ra says, you will have a harvest into the fourth density, but um, there, it will not be a great harvest because your planet's very mixed. And so the way that it works is that, it's the way it works with anything really, whether it's religion or old systems, old ideologies, they sort of just die off with time, right? As each successive generation just resonates less and less with the old model and seeks for something new and more free and more, more true to who they are. We outgrow the old belief system. So our planet will slowly continue to outgrow all of these service to self forms of control and enslavement and um, infringing on free will, it just isn't going to resonate with our, with our collective for very much longer. So my perspective of what's happening now has shifted from the stress, anger, fear reactions to very much like excitement. When you know you can take the aerial view that the law of one provides really well of what's happening metaphysically in our planet and say, wow, actually everything is happening according to plan. You know, the earth has to do some really deep shadow work to purge these forms of darkness from our collective, because as we know, there's been a whole lot of really nasty and evil injustices humans have committed on one another for thousands of years. So we're kind of seeing that being healed as we want justice, we want freedom, we want righteousness, and we're seeing this uprising now. And I don't know about you guys, but it feels very much like the pendulum is starting to swing back where people are getting bolder to stand up for freedom and righteousness and justice. 
and standing against a lot of the, the mandates and the control. So I'm, I'm growing more and more excited and happy about what I'm seeing because when you understand how polarity works, you just understand like we don't make real changes unless we're met with a catalyst, unless we have a challenge to overcome. And it's like, hey, if this is the challenge we need to like wake up, guys, you're allowing your whole planet to be enslaved by wealthy elites who don't have the planet's best interest in mind. When we wake up to that collectively and say, ah, oh, we're going to say no to that, then, it, then it's over, right? Because we have all of the power as soon as we wake up to who we are and become unified. Yeah, well said. So I know I can feel and sense um, uh, some of the uh, telepathic chatter that's taking place here with the <laughs> with our <laughs> audience. Um, you know, what, what are some of the ways in which um, in this particular now moment in all of that's taking place, um, you know, how can, from your experience and, and the way, you know, what comes through you and sharing, what are some of the best ways to be able to um, really kind of tap into our own unique expression and blueprint of what we're meant to do in the flow of all that's, you know, that's happening and taking place? Yeah, I, lo I love the way you phrased that because in your question, I think is the is my answer, which is that we have to start, we just have to start being true to who we are and finding our unique soul's expression and then just following it with all of the passion and faith that we can muster. Um, I'm very passionate about talking about how we move to an enlightened civilization. I just, I could talk about this forever because all the potential is right here. Like we have the technology, we have the means, we have the ability to communicate with each other to make a truly enlightened world. If we all want that and know what that looks like and say yes to it and begin creating it. And so I think as we do that, it's going to look like little pockets of parts of the world that understand, okay, the old system is out there. It's still running, you know, tyrannical governments controlling countries all around the world. That's okay. We can't change that system from inside of it. We can just refuse to participate in it any longer and make our own world, right? So we've seen like a lot of these mandates are bringing about a lot of really great change. Um, one example being like, I grew up in California, born and raised, and um they just instituted like mandatory vaccinations for like five years old through, um, through high school, right. For, for all children, if you want to go to school and parents are just outraged and there's this huge upset in California, but then the, re the response is, well, then let's just make our own schools. And I'm like, yes, that's how an enlightened civilization has to think. Right. And when we start opening the pathways for everyone to find where they fit into that society, that enlightened civilization, we will make a world where everyone gets to do what they're passionate about and make a living off of it and thrive in it. Because as more and more needs arise in a society, like, Hey, we need better education systems. People who are passionate about that will start rising up and filling those gaps, whether it's technology or medicine or any industry you could name as those needs arise. When we have a community of people who say we're all in this for the greater good of all of us, like service to others, that's our orientation. Then we will naturally fill those roles with our passion because even, even our passion is given to us by the universe. It's like you, in a sense, me, the person, the individual doesn't even choose my passion. The passion chooses me. The passion is that divine energy that wants to express itself through somebody. And so for me, it's chosen to express the desire to teach and communicate higher knowledge, let's say. For you guys, it's to, it wants to express having a platform to communicate with people about unity consciousness and medicine and education and on and on and on. So I think we have to start finding our passion and stop feeling like we have no choice but to be enslaved to a job or a system we don't really like because we got to earn a paycheck. It's like that's such a lack mentality, right? That we have to let go of and understand that the universe is pure abundance. It will have your back no matter what you want to do. If you have faith and trust in it, like the universe will make a way. And I think that really is the bridge to an enlightened civilization. Love that. So you, beautiful. You've touched on like some of my favorite spiritual mantras, <laughs> faith, nice. trust, and surrender, right? It's at the foundation of, you know, foundational building blocks of 
everything that's moving in way of, of law of one. So yeah. Um, beautifully said, thank you. Yeah. And I see, and I feel the world that you're talking about and where everybody is able to contribute, you know, their own unique gifts and talents and really be of service in a variety of different ways. And so I'd love to talk to you about that because, you know, Ra talks about sort of the preparation of being in service to others and that at being a really important distinction in terms of raising consciousness. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a hugely important distinction because we still live in a world that says, look out for number one, you know, self-survival. Like we saw that with the, the toilet paper shortages and the food shortages, like that's still the, the fear the fear-based reactions are still haven't been healed in us, which is why I say every world problem we're seeing right now, they're all just actually spiritual problems, right? They're problems that exist within us that we haven't healed yet. And so they have the capacity to keep manifesting in the collective. There's enough energy going in that direction of greed or selfishness that the, that, that energy has to express somewhere. Right. And so this is where, projection and healing becomes so important because what, what we're actually doing in our world right now, to a large extent, um, for the segment of the population that just can't accept or believe what's really happening behind the curtain, it's because we're still projecting our denial onto the world. Meaning if I haven't really looked inside of myself and really met that part of me, that's greedy, you know, that wants to get one over on somebody and maybe um, wants to round down on the tip and all these things. If I haven't really met that greedy aspect of my ego and, and met it with love and forgiveness and healed it, then I won't be able to believe that wealthy elites could be so greedy to do these horrible things to people because I'm denying it in myself. Well, I'm a good person. I would never do that. So they would never do that. But when you see it in yourself, your eyes and your discernment become razor sharp to see it in the world. But your response when you see it isn't anger and rage and injustice and whatever. It's very much like, okay, there's something that needs to be healed. So we, we got to get to work, right? So the service to others model is the opposite of the lookout for number one. It's like, hey, we don't have to feel afraid anymore about whatever happens in the world because we're all in this together. Let's link hands. We'll have each other's best interest in mind. And surely with enough of us, there's nothing we can't do, right? So the service to others model will eventually rid our world of fear and fear-based reactions to any of the calamities we see, whether it's natural disasters, or economic crashes, we won't live in the fight or flight mode any longer once we know that we all have each other's backs. And one more perfect example of this is, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the farming crisis happening right now, but a lot of farmers are coming out on the internet and YouTube and social media saying like, Hey, we're all being told by the federal government to destroy our crops. And if we don't, they're going to get rid of our, um, our subsidies and all these things. So they're, they're paying us one and a half times what our farm is worth to destroy our crops because they want to have a monopoly on where food comes from and all that and the distribution. So local farmers, they're trying to put them out of business. And it's like, that's not a problem with unity consciousness, right? Because we just say, hey, don't worry about it. We are glad to pay you great money for your crops. We don't need the government. You don't need their subsidies. You don't need to rely on them. We can rely on one another and we can build the world that we want. And I just think that's so beautiful. It really is. Aaron, what are some other ways that service to self strategies can be somehow, you know, woven in? So like the strategies we kind of see happening now. Yeah. Well, I think when it comes to service to self strategies, I'm actually releasing a video tomorrow called false light that details this um, really deeply, but the basic strategy of the service to self path as raw lays it out in the law of one is that um, we, we tend to think about the negative polarity, like, you know, Darth Vader is going to stroll in or some kind of mustache twirling villain, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's absolutely not how the negative polarity shows up. They show up more like the Gavin Newsom's, like really well-dressed, handsome, slicked back hair. They know great smile. They know how to talk. They know how to say all the things you want to hear. And so if you don't have a really sharp discernment and wisdom, 
to pick up where they're asking you to betray your integrity or, or they're making some sort of bargain. Like, um, like we see like mandates, right? We're giving you a free choice and they'll always present it like that. But of course it's not a free choice because at one end is an ultimatum, a punishment or a consequence. It's, it's very much like a narcissistic abuser in a relationship will be. It's like, um, I'm doing this because I love you. Right. Or, um, you're not allowed to go out with your friends anymore without me because I want to protect you. I need to know you're safe, right? No more single nights with your girlfriends anymore. Um, and the, the narcissistic abuser will take more and more freedom away from her life and put it into his hands, but he will always paint it as love or I, I care. It's a virtuous reason. So we have to know what the light is first and foremost. If we're going to detect false light, we have to know real light, which light in this analogy is love, right? Love knows no bargaining. Love knows no reward. It's not going to ask you to do anything to get something out of it. It cares only for you, only to be of service. And so if there's any ultimatum involved at all, if the choices presented have any kind of contingency at all, if you're being asked in any way to violate your own free will or integrity, if you're being asked to see yourself as a victim to something, these are all attributes of false light. So they'll dress it up with nice sounding words. But if you can detect those things, victimization, denying your integrity, bargaining for freedom, then you know it's coming from false light, plain and simple. Ooh, we're, we, uh, we've had, we have a lot to uh, sort through. <laughs> <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, and that system and that system. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oops. Right. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, but the beautiful thing that Ra explains in the law of one about the negative polarity is that this is why we can't have any judgment. We can't make the government an enemy or anyone an enemy because it's not as if the way that our mind paints it when we see these like corrupt leaders and politicians is, oh, look at this evil person that rose to power. And it's actually not like that. Ra explains that power by virtue of what it is automatically will polarize you to the negative in the same way that experiencing love will automatically polarize you to the positive. Like we've all seen movies or, or stories where um, the villain in the story maybe like meets a little child or some innocent animal or character that slowly makes the villain more pure over time because it learns to love something. So it's polarizing the bad guy to the positive. And then at the end of the movie, the villain has this reconciliation becomes the good guy. Lots of movies like with that storyline, it's the same on the opposite end of the spectrum where you can be a you know, good person with great intentions. I want to go into politics to help people. And then as more lobbyists come your way and more millions and millions and eventually billions, and you realize I have the, enough wealth and power to control entire institutions and make them do whatever I want. It gives the ego so much more leverage over your mind and it will automatically polarize that person to the negative. So it's actually not that evil people rise to power. And if we use evil as a misnomer, but it's that power makes people evil. So it's like, I can't judge them for that because who knows if I found myself with that level of wealth and power, if I wouldn't be doing the same things, we only have to refuse to participate in those systems and just create a new world. I think that's such an important distinction because right now there is so much power and weight on those systems. And as we, you know, shift our energy away that starts to dissipate. And, and yeah. you're right, you know, so many people go into politics with really positive intentions. Yeah, but the system itself, to your point, is built on matrices of, you know, uh, and entanglements of such false light that, right. you know, it's like you're walking into something that's already completely constructed at its, you know, at its roots um, and right. in that, sort of false light in that darkness, in that sort of magnetizing, sort of sucking you into the vortex. And so one thing I, I, I keep hearing coming over and over again, because you've obviously, you know, are able to um, really find your center point. Like as I'm looking at your energy and I mean, you're just, you're there, like there's no wavering from that, right? So, you know, what would you offer to those listening um, in way of how you made it to that place of just 
always dialing into, mm-hmm. you know, that zero point of your own source connection, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is the most important question right now. Um, I put a post on my story, I think yesterday about this exact subject where I was just saying like, we have to remember that the most important thing any of us can be doing right now is just to work on ourselves and expand our consciousness and heal. Because each one of us that heals our greed, let's say, we, we take a little more greed out of the collective consciousness, which means that the greedy world leaders are going to get less and less greedy over time because they are a manifestation of us, right? It's the collective consciousness is like the soil that everything grows in. So if we want no more greed to manifest in our governments and systems and institutions, we have to get it out of the soil, which is you and me. So it's like, take, take this time to just take radical ownership of your own growth and make it the most important thing in your life, right? To expand my consciousness, to become more aware of my blind spots, to heal my traumas, uh, to forgive those who uh, have hurt me in the past. And as each one of us raises our own vibration, you know, it creates the snowball effect where the more, the higher the frequency of the collective gets, the more accessible it gets for other people to start awakening all around the world, just by nature of the frequency. And Ra talks about this in the fifth density of consciousness, uh, fifth density beings being in the wisdom density. Apparently um, that's their form of service is expanding their psychic capacity and expanding their consciousness and connectedness with creation. They know that by actually just making my own consciousness as polarized as possible, that's the greatest assistance I can be to this planet or to any planet I'm on. And so if we take that same approach, I think we'll see so much good coming out of it so much more so than because I'm all about like, yes, we need to bring awareness to the corruption in the world and we need to see what needs to be healed in the world. But if we don't heal these things in ourselves, another corrupt politician will take his place. Another wealthy elite will take their place. We're just going to keep replacing the same characters because they're just manifestations of the energy in us. Right? So I love how the law of one says, you know, the best things you can do is number one, as you gaze in the mirror, behold the creator, see yourself, know yourself as the source in human form. And that in and of itself opens the heart chakra, allows you to feel more connected with everything. But second step Ross says is look at the other selves and see the creator as well. So stop seeing other people as outside of me and separate from me. Just see everyone as that one great energy expressing itself. And that one energy is love, but the degree to which we are ignorant of that energy, that divinity in all of us, it becomes negatively polarized and we get all the corruption and the evil. So it's not that they're, it's their fault that they're that way. They don't know who they are. And so we can't blame them, right? It's up to us to shine that light, to know who I am, which then makes me sort of by virtue of my own energy, I become a teacher of that to anyone who interacts with me. They, they contact a, a bit of the divine that starts to wake up that consciousness in themselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful.